Dear attendees, in the next 20 minutes, we will talk about oral dental manifestations of ehlers danlos syndromes. My name is Ines Kapfara-Seebacher. I am a periodontist from the Medical University of Innsbruck in Austria. I am a periodontist and will talk about periodontitis with a special focus on periodontal EDS. My colleague, Ulrike Leppardinger, will start the presentation with an overview on dental abnormalities of ehlers danlos syndromes. Thank you, Ines. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. In 2012, the World Health Organization stated that oral health is essential for the quality of life. A healthy mouth facilitates painless feeding, eases chewing, and enables articulated speech. It thus largely contributes to personal well-being and socializing, yet only when being devoid of discomfort or embarrassment. As dentists, we focus on the oral cavity in our daily work life. Especially when working with patients affected by rare diseases, it is very important to enable evidence-based treatment. However, as you will see, for EDS, the scientific evidence on oral dental manifestations and treatment options is still very low. So when looking at the tooth morphology, it seems quite obvious that Ehlers-Danlos syndromes are associated with hard and soft tissue manifestations in the oral cavity. So enamel is the only dental tissue not containing collagen, um, or at least it only contains small parts of collagen type one and seven. Um, enamel for, forms the outer layer of the tooth crown, and it mainly consists of 96% anorganic hydroxyapatite. Um, it is the hardest tissue of the body, and we only can cut it with diamonds. So dentine forms the bulk of the tooth and is composed of 70% hydroxyapatite crystals embedded in a three-dimensional collagenous network. The dental pulp is um, a soft con uh, connective tissue with collagen type one and three, and is also called the dental nerve. In the second part of the talk, Ines Kaparasebacher will tell you more about the periodontal ligament and periodontitis. So the question is, are these manifestations of EDS? In the medical literature, there have been described different dental uh, manifestations of EDS like supernumerous teeth, rotated teeth, or tooth transpositions. So a tooth transposition is just when teeth switch their places. Supernumerous teeth are extra teeth and rotated teeth if they're just not in the right order. Um, so these findings have been described only in single case reports. And we're not sure if these are manifestations of uh, EDS or if these are just coincidental findings. So there's limited evidence on that because people without EDS have these uh, clinical pictures as well. So um, there is uh, the question if there is carries a manifestation of EDS, so various dental problems like um, an increased risk of dental caries are claimed to be associated with EDS. However, these statements are mostly based on single case reports or personal recollections of affected individuals. Um, hence, the true prevalence and clinical relevance are unknown. A recent study investigated orodental manifestations of hypermobile EDS compared to healthy controls, and the researchers found no statistically significant differences between hypermobile and healthy controls with regard to the prevalence of dental caries. So it is very important to say that caries is always associated with oral hygiene and nutrition. So dental caries runs on sugar and loves sugar, and currently it is impossible to say whether an increased incidence of caries is associated with different EDS types. So what we know is that all kinds of EDS um, are associated with pulp stones. So if you look at the first picture, the pulp calcifications, you see the dental nerve as a grayish part in the middle of the crown. And in, there are these whitish opalescences, and these are actual stones. And they are not really a problem, so they don't hurt or um, 
you can't feel them, but if a root channel treatment is needed, they can block the access to the root channel and make the life as a dentist a bit more complicated, but not impossible to do a proper root channel treatment. Um, what we have seen with classical EDS um, were shortened roots, like very strongly shortened roots or no roots. And these teeth are very loose. And so they can um, sometimes, this looseness can be misinterpreted as a localized peritonitis. Um, shortened roots have been described so far in nine individuals and that's not a lot. Um, so the true prevalence of this finding is still unclear. Um, so hypoplastic roots were described in periodontal EDS as well. Um, so as you can see, periodontal EDS, um, it, here it, it's normal that a tooth has three roots. And the difference in vascular EDS is that some cases are described um, to have a root fusions with exceeding root lengths. Um, these are all just biologic variations and not really pathologies, but um, yeah, interesting to see. What we know is that some rare EDS types have specific oral soft tissue manifestations. So severe and generalized gingival hyperplasia has been described in children with dermatosporactic EDS. The gingival enlargement was nodular, fragile, and inflamed. But so far, this was only described in seven individuals. Of um, great significance for all people with EDS is that there seems to be a resistance um, to local anesthetics. The adequacy of pain prevention during dental procedures through application of local anesthetics has been evaluated in an online survey um, through various social media platforms to 980 people with EDS and 249 not affected people. And it showed that EDS patients reported 88% um, uh, inadequate pain prevention, suggesting that local anesthetics are less effective um, in um, EDS patients. So there seems to be a resistance on local anesthetics in EDS, but we don't know really why. Um, the best working um, agent was articaine, and that's good because that's the most commonly used, followed by bupivacaine and mepivacaine, and uh, these are very long-lasting anesthetics, so articaine should be preferred. Um, as I told you before, um, a healthy mouth facilitates painless feeding, eases chewing, and enables articulated speech. And in a recent study done last year, physical oral health was clinically determined in EDS individuals. In parallel, the patients provided self-reports on quality of life related to oral health. And the results showed that the objectively measured oral health of participants with EDS often appeared good, even if the participants reported low oral health related quality of life. Important factors that contributed to reduced self-reported oral health related quality of life were physical pain in the mouth area, oral handicap, anxiety, and the feeling of insecurity with respect to the teeth, dentures, or mouth. Um, there's a serious paucity of studies on individual quality of life with regard to oral health in individuals with EDS and most other rare diseases so far. Oh, thank you. And Ines will continue with her part. Thank you, Ulrike. Now let's talk about periodontitis. Periodontitis in general is a highly prevalent disease. Approximately 70% of the adult population are affected at least by mild periodontitis and about 11% are affected by severe periodontitis. Periodontitis is characterized by an inflammatory destruction of the tooth supporting tissues. And I will explain you now what this means. Here you can see a healthy tooth. And what you can see is that the tooth root is surrounded by alveolar bone. And the tooth root is fixed to the bone by the periodontal ligament. This periodontal ligament is a specialized connective tissue. And what you can also see is that the collagenous fibers, 
this is collagen one, anchors the tooth root to the alveolar bone. In health, the alveolar crest is located approximately one millimeter beyond the tooth crown. With periodontitis, we have an inflammatory destruction of the bone and the periodontal ligament. And what happens is that the tooth becomes mobile and finally falls out. Periodontitis is caused by peripathogenic bacteria, or let's rather say it is initiated by peripathogenic bacteria because there are a lot of other factors which influence the onset and also the proceeding of the periodontal destruction. For example, heavy smoking is a, an important risk factor. This means uh, more than 10 cigarettes per day, but also diabetes, adipositas, an unhealthy diet with a lot of sugars, or also stress is an important risk factor for periodontitis. We also know that there are some genetic risk factors for periodontitis. Um, Yes, so the question is whether people with EDS have an increased risk of periodontitis. This is claimed again and again by some societies, but also by some authors. And what I can tell you today is that this is not true. We don't have a single clinical study showing that people with EDS have an increased risk of periodontitis with one exception, this is periodontal EDS. I will talk about this later. For example, for vascular EDS, we have two very nice, well-designed clinical studies, and they looked at periodontal disease and also on other oral dental manifestations. And what they have seen is that the people with vascular EDS didn't have an increased prevalence of periodontitis. There was more gum bleeding, but not periodontal destruction. This is completely different with periodontal EDS. Periodontal EDS is a specific EDS subtype. It is not classical EDS and periodontitis or hypermobile EDS and periodontitis. Of course, uh, your patients um, or uh, the people who are um, affected by EDS, they may have classical EDS and general periodontitis or hypermobile EDS and periodontitis because periodontitis is a highly prevalent disease, but this is not periodontal EDS, okay? Periodontal EDS is a specific subtype. It is caused by mutations in C1R and C1S. And the periodontitis is severe, rapidly progressing with an early onset in the adolescence at the mean age of 14 years. There are some uh, individuals who already have periodontitis of the primary dentition and the parents told us that single teeth fell out already at an age of three or four years. Um, typically, the, the teeth fall out with the whole root, with the intact root. This is typical for periodontal uh, tooth loss. Uh, if periodontitis is not treated, then complete tooth loss uh, happens at an age of 20 years. But fortunately, we have good periodontists and oral hygienists, and they can help the people to keep their teeth longer. So why is periodontal EDS associated with periodontitis, but not the other EDS types? This is because periodontal EDS is caused by mutations in complement one the subunits R and S. And complement one is a very important immune defense pathway, especially in the mouth. In the mouth, complement one attaches to the bacteria and then initiates the innate immune defense. And now you can imagine if we have a, a genetic mutation here in complement one, then we have a problem with the immune defense. 
Other main characteristic features of periodontal EDS are pre-tibial discolorations and also a specific gum phenotype. You can see here children with periodontal EDS and what you can see is that they have very thin and fragile gums. You can see this because the vessels are clearly visible because the gums are so thin. That's why you can see the vessels. If you look at the healthy siblings, you can't see the vessels shining through because they have a thick band of keratinized gingiva, which is fixed with collagen to the periosteum. And this thick band of gingiva is missing in children with periodontal EDS. And this seems to be a patognomonic feature of periodontal EDS. People with periodontal EDS also have an increased risk for peri-implantitis. Peri-implantitis is very similar to periodontitis, but it, it affects dental implants. And um, we love to place implants when teeth were lost because um, it is such a great solution. It is a little bit expensive, but it is really great if you can place a screw and fix ceramic teeth on this screw. The problem is that when you have periodontal EDS, the bone around the dental implant also may be destructed by an inflammatory reaction. And then the dental implant has to be removed. You can see this here. For example, on this x-ray, you can see that the threads of the screw are not covered anymore by bone or also in this individual, you can see the threads of the implant screws because the alveolar bone was destructed. It is important to know that there is, there seems to be no increased risk for peri-implantitis for other EDS types, but we have only one case series, including five individuals with hypermobile or classical EDS. So the evidence is very low for implants with EDS. In conclusion, we can say that it seems that all types of EDS are associated with an increased resistance to local anesthetics. We have really good evidence that early severe periodontitis is a characteristic manifestation of periodontal EDS, but not of the other EDS subtypes. We know that uh, several EDS types are associated with pulp stones, especially periodontal EDS and classical EDS. And we know that classical EDS may manifest with shortened roots and vascular EDS with exceeding root length. But most important, it is to say that we have a striking lack of scientific evidence with oral dental manifestations. And that's why Ulrike and I decided to make a clinical study on oral manifestations. And we will do these studies in Austria, in Germany, in Switzerland, and in UK. We will uh, investigate periodontal disease, enamel defects, root deformities, temporal mandibular joint, and implant success. So if you um, think, oh, I really would be part of the study, but I'm not living in Austria or Germany or Switzerland or England, um, then you can write me an email. And um, if it is possible for you to get a dental x-ray, uh, an OPG, usually your dentist has an OPG, and you ask him just to send it to you. And if you could send us your OPG and fill out a questionnaire, this would also help us to collect uh, data on oral manifestations. And hopefully, Uli and I can present you the results of this study in a few years. Thank you for your attention.